Now, your first story collection, Mothers and Sons, um, you said in one interview that they've nothing really in common except a general gloom. Um, would you say that's a certain characteristic of your work as a whole? Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember in Australia once a woman was buying one of my books. She said to me, so how many die in this one? I said, oh, it's much worse than the last one. Oh, listen, don't you? Know? And I wanted to put a sign up on Mothers and Sons, a collection of stories saying, dear mom, things are bad between us, but not as bad as some of the people in this book. Um, and uh, there's a very long story at the end of the book, which is called A Long Winter. And that was written, um, someone told me a story in the Pyrenees that a woman had left the house. She was alcoholic in a beautiful winter's day but the snow had come down very quickly and buried her and they couldn't find her. And I slowly realized what I could do with this. I mean, most people would just listen to that story and just get on with their lives. And I pounced on that story. I then worked out with somebody else that how they would find her eventually would be that, that they wouldn't find the body, but they would look at the sky for vultures. And then I, I don't know anything about birds, so I found out that vultures go south in the winter because vultures can't cut through frozen meat. So they go south. So when the spring comes, vultures will come back up to the Pyrenees. And that's what you watch for. You don't look at the ground looking for the body. You look at the sky and you run because that's where she will be when the vultures appear. So, I mean, I have a diseased imagination. The minute that idea occurred to me of vultures in the sky, of walking in the mountains, constantly watching to see when the first vultures would come. And then I had the idea that the story would be told from her husband's point of view. But then my mother had died, and slowly, without me even thinking about it, it became the son's search for his lost mother, that she was dead but not found dead, and that he could still find her. And then also my brother had died suddenly. It was a sort of disaster. And in a way that you can't leave things out of fiction that are deeply preoccupying you. You find metaphors for them. Suddenly, this is a boy who himself and his brother shared a room, as I had done in childhood with my brother. And the, the, other, the brother has gone off to military service and he's missing. So the brother is missing and the mother is missing. And our hero is a solitary figure missing both of them and searching for the mother, searching as though, you, as though you would search in a dream for someone who's dead. And you'd wake up realizing what a foolish thing that search was because it's in vain. And so I really worked on that story, uh, w trying to work my way through certain things that had happened to me, but, but not directly. And uh, I suppose a lot of the book has bits and pieces of all that stuff in it about loss, um, and gloom, and, uh, but I mean, I, I wish it would go away. One of the stories I found most moving was the one about the child abusing priest. You could say that's become, in a way, a, a cliche of, of modern Ireland, you know, all the scandals about child abusing priests, but you tell it from the point of view of his aged mother, who's gradually discovering her son has been charged with sexual abuse, and yet she loves him, you know? There's, there's no end to that. Well, I, 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 I was in an interesting position in Ireland when, you know, I mean, the, those stories came to us originally from Canada because the boys of, is it, what's it called, the boys of St. Vincent, Vincent was shown yeah. on British television, not Irish television, but everyone in Ireland saw it. And I remember one night saying to someone, I wonder if that will happen here, you know, if priests will be charged and something. I don't think so. Within two years, the, the, every evening at six o'clock news, priests were in handcuffs. And I had been for two years in St. Peter's College, Wexford, which was one of the schools where a number of the priests ended up in jail. In fact, there was, uh, they were investigated, a thing was written called the Ferns Report about the diocese, which I'm from. Now, I had known those priests personally. And it was a very difficult time because I had liked them. They weren't monsters. And I had to think very deeply about what had happened. And what had happened is as follows. And, and it was a hard thing to say in Ireland in those years when there was a public hysteria about it was that some of those men had mistaken their homosexuality when homosexuality was unmentionable and thought it was a vocation for the priesthood. 
In other words, that while other contemporaries could not dream of becoming a priest because they could not dream of living a life as celibates, suddenly a life as a priest was, was a solution to homosexuality. They had gone in all good faith into the seminary. They had gone through their 20s and 30s doing you know, teaching, um, being really good teachers, being really good priests, and often in their 40s, they just couldn't handle it again. And what I wanted to know was, what, what, was, what, was everyone sure, especially heterosexual men, that if their sexuality had to be kept a secret, if their interest in women was a dark, strange, unmentionable thing, and if they were put in charge of a school of 300 girls aged between 13 and 18, and if they were in that school over 30 years, were they sure that they wouldn't once, in one semester, in one term, hit on a beautiful 16-year-old girl? Were, were they absolutely certain about that? Because I wasn't. And it wasn't as though the priest didn't do enormous amounts of damage, because you were talking about a thwarted, gnarled sexuality that, that made its way into ugly use and abuse of power and did dreadful damage to, to the victims. And the victims suffered enormously. No one is denying that. And, but that the priests themselves did not always, were not always sexual predators. They began in all innocence, in, in a difficult time, in a difficult place. And I felt very sorry for them. And I have to say, saying that out loud now might be as difficult, but a few years ago in Ireland, that, that oddly enough was almost unsayable. That they were, and the way they were photographed and the way they were dealt with as absolute monsters and pariahs in the society, where one year the church has all this authority, and the next year it's, it's the, almost a, a, a man walking in the street wearing a priest's collar is almost to be shouted at and abused. Well, I just thought that was ugly. Could you tell us a little about your next novel, Brooklyn? Um, yeah, I've written a novel called Brooklyn. It's about an Irish girl who's totally innocent, really nice, and she goes to Brooklyn in 1951, and she works selling nylon stockings. So I had to do a whole lot of research on nylon stockings and uh, on the whole business of um, emigration from Ireland in those years. And, um, and, and, and there is a story in the book of actually what happens. And there's a whole lot of things that I've never managed to write about properly before, like love, um, like, you know, just open, innocent love. And I hope it was a whole new phase in my life that I could start, you know, just being less gloomy.